Hey everybody, Matt from 90thPercentile.ca here. For access to more study notes, practice questions, mock exams, and end chapter question videos, visit 90thPercentile.ca and sign up for your free trial today. Link below in the description. This learning module is an introduction to linear regression. Once again, might be a new topic to some of you. If it is, don't worry about it. If it isn't, great. Either way, we're going to go through some of the key learning points in this module, which are one, learn how to interpret the output of a linear regression and two, how to analyze whether or not the regression model has predictive power. So to put it really, really simply, a linear regression, all it is, if you're looking at the chart on the left-hand side, is imagine we have a scatter plot of Y values on the Y axis and X values along the X axis, and we have you know, scatter plot with the, the red dots representing some of the values that, we, that they take. All a linear regression is, is creating a line of best fit that is used to predict the y value for a certain level of x. That's all it is. We're given a data set and we run a regression model, which is a lot simpler than you would actually think. Um, linear regressions are typically done you know, in Excel and some, some other type of softwares. Um, but basically, like I said, all we're doing is drawing a line of best fit for the data and we're analyzing whether or not this line of best, best fit actually has predictive power. So if it's actually useful for creating forecasts or not. And in order to do that, essentially the, the line that we create is gonna follow this equation, which is yi, or the y value is equal to the intercept, plus bi, which is the slope of the line, and then xi, which is our x value along the x axis here. And then we're also going to have an error term. This this uh, notation is an error term because regression model isn't perfect. It doesn't have you know 100% predictive power. At least it rarely, rarely does. Um, so we're going to analyze what what this means as well. But like I said, we're going to see some outputs. Just coming to topic number one here. We're going to analyze some outputs. We're going to understand how to interpret the intercept, the slope, and the error term and what this means for our analysis. And we're also gonna look at some metrics to determine what the predictive power of our model is, whether or not it's actually useful in forecasting. And there's a couple of things that we're gonna look at here, the big one being the R squared metric. And we're also gonna have some tests for significance, which are similar to the hypothesis test that we've gone over previously, but a little bit different. Some of the calculations are a little bit different in terms of the test stats that we're calculating, but the overall concept is the same. Really quickly, before we jump into the questions, I wanted to hop into Excel. And I just want to show you how a regression analysis is actually done in Excel. So it might, you know, demystify a little bit for some of you who haven't seen it before. It might seem like a really complex or, or foreign topic, but it's really, it's really not that difficult. Um, so you can use this example. Let's say I own like a ice cream sale shop and I have temperature in column A, so this is the temperature of a certain day, and these are the sales of ice cream that I sold, like dollar amounts that I sold in the day. And we can create a regression analysis just to see how much differences in temperature affect my sales. So we're gonna use temperature as the independent variable and sales as the dependent variable. So the sales will be influenced by or depend on the temperature. So if I wanted to do this in Excel, I could go to da the data tab, and then there's another Excel add-in called data analysis. So I could click on that. This isn't standard with Excel. You just have to go through like options to enable this. But anyway, I can come down this list and click on regression. And I have my ranges already set up, but I would just make my Y value or my dependent variable because on a regression, the, the, the Y axis is the dependent variable. So I could set this range equal to this and the x or independent variable is already set to this range and that's all done i can click ok and you can see right away that i get a output of a regression analysis and if i open up these columns you're going to get so, you know pretty familiar with this with this output this is the typical regression output we have a bunch of different metrics here um, these regression stats are mainly used to describe the like high level metrics of the test you know, like the strength of the relationship and all that. Um, but what we're really concerned about throughout the curriculum are these values down here, 
which are the coefficients. Um, and these essentially are used to describe how much the independent variable affects the dependent variable. So in like a simple one variable regression that we did, we have a coefficient of temperature of 6.9, which says that basically what it's saying is that for every one degree increase in temperature, you're going to get an extra, call it $7 in sales. Um, there's some other metrics that we can, that we're going to get to like the T side and the P value. But like I said, just wanted to show you a really basic example of what a regression is um, to maybe clear up some, some questions that you had if you haven't seen it before. Right away, we're getting into a pretty formula heavy question. So we have Julie Moon, who's an energy analyst examining electricity, oil, and natural gas consumption in different regions over different seasons. She ran a simple regression explaining the variation in energy consumption as a function of temperature. So the energy consumption is dependent, temperature is independent, because the temperature is explaining the energy consumption. The total variation of the dependent variable was 140. So total variation is 140. 0.58 and the explained variation from the model is 60.16 explained it is 60.16 and in a we're asked to calculate the coefficient of determination which is also known as the r squared and all the r squared is is it is a quick metric that describes basically how good your model is at explaining the relationship amongst the variables so in this case how well does temperature explain energy consumption? How much of the variation in energy consumption can be attributed to temperature? And the R squared very simply is the explained variation from your regression model over the total variation in the variable. So I'm gonna put the value here already, but we have total and explained, so I could put this out, so 60.16 over 140.58 and we get an r squared or coefficient of determination of 0. around 0. 4, 0. 0.42 so this means that 42 percent of the difference in energy consumption or the variation in energy consumption can be attributed or can be explained by temperature generally a higher r squared is indicative of a better model, a better regression model that has more explanatory power. 0.42 is kind of on the border. It's, you know, some of the variation is explained, some isn't, but if you have an R squared of like one, that's a perfect model, whereas an R squared of zero is, doesn't explain anything. Um, and if you came back to the quick regression model that I met, that, that I made for the ice cream sales and temperature, you can see that you have the R squared up here, which is 0 0.0007. <laughs> and you can tell that by me inputting a bunch of random values here, it's not gonna have much explanatory power, which makes sense. Like I just tossed in some random values and there's not really a relationship based on this data um, that temperature impacts my, my ice cream sales. For B, we're asked to calculate the F stat to test the fit of the model. So really quickly, an F test, in regressions is it's the same kind of concept as what we talked about in hypothesis testing but here um, what this test is actually doing is testing all of the independent variables and what it's doing it's testing the strength of how how well all the independent variables predict the dependent variable. So in this case, we're testing if temperature is a good predictor of energy consumption. Um, in this case, we only have one independent variable, but, but uh, something to note is that the F test, if you had like another, another independent variable, so temperature and I don't know, location or like city or something like that, it, the F test tests the significance of all of them at the same time. So it's not just to test one of them individually, in this case, we only have one variable, so of course we're testing it individually, but if you had you know, a multiple linear, linear regression with multiple independent variables, then it would test all of the significance at the exact same time. To isolate whether or not one of them is significant in a multiple linear regression, you're going to have to do a different test.
But anyway, we have a different formula here. This is different than in the hypothesis testing. And the F stat that you're calculating is the explained variance from your model. So we can bring this over here. The explained variance we already went over is 60.16 divided by K. And K is the number of independent variables that you have. Here it's one, so I can write it, but it's not gonna make a difference. So divided by one. And then the unexplained variance is just the difference of the total variance and what we actually explained. So it's 140.58 subtract 60.16. And then this is gonna be divided by the sample size N, which is 60 minus K number of variables, so minus one, and then another minus one at the end. And if I ran this calc out, we get an F stat of 43.39. So this is our, our F stat. The, th this question is not asking us to compare this to a critical value, but it, it, if the question was asking us, you know, whether or not to say if the independent variables are significant, we would have to compare this value was calculated to a critical F value. For C, we're asked to calculate the standard error of the estimate. And all of this is, is essentially the standard deviation of the variance in our estimate versus the actual observed value of the dependent variable. So we have a simple formula here. So standard error equals the square root of the mean squared error. And all this is really is the variance of the values that our regression model is, is not explaining versus what the actual values for energy consumption are. So the mean squared error was actually what we just calculated in the denominator for the F stat. So it's the unexplained variance, which is the total variance, which is the 140 minus what we actually explained. So total minus explained. And then to calculate the mean or the average of this, we do exactly what we just did, where we divide it by n minus k minus 1. So if we wanted to do this again, we could do um, total is 140.58 subtract 60.16. So this is going to be unexplained in these brackets. Divided by same thing. So 60 minus 1 minus 1 is 58. Because k, there's just one variable. Um, run this out and we get um, 1.38655 and then if we take this square root of that we're going to get 1.177 as our answer for the standard error of the estimate. For D we have to calculate the sample standard deviation of monthly energy consumption. So this is a little bit different than the standard error of the estimate. Here, we were concerned about our estimated value from the regression model and how that differs from the actual values of energy consumption. So we're worried about the error or what's unexplained from our model. Whereas here, all we're worried about is the sample standard deviation of the energy consumption. So we're only worried about the actual observed values so to do that, we have, you know, a sample standard deviation formula that we're all familiar with by now. In this case, it's actually yi. This is just the observed value of the dependent variable. Subtract the means. We're looking for the difference around the mean squared divided by n minus 1. And it turns out that we actually have this already. This, the numerator is already provided in the question. We have the total variation the dependent variable is this. So if we wanted to solve, go 140.58 over n minus 1, so 60 minus 1, 59. And that gets us 2.38. And this is actually the, effectively the variance. Um, we got to get the standard deviation, right? So I take the square root of this, which is 1.54. So that is our Sample standard deviation of monthly energy consumption. You're examining the results of a, of a regression estimation that attempts to explain the unit sales growth of a business you are researching. 
The analysis of variance output for the regression is given in the following table. The regression was based on five observations. So we have a couple different columns here. We have the regression, sum of squares, mean square, f stat, and p value. So this is basically what's this is saying how much of the variation in our dependent variable, which is what? Um, unit sales growth. How, how much of the unit sales growth is explained by our regression model? And we'll go over some of the columns here. And then the residual is just what's not explained by our model. And the total, this 95.2 is going to be the actual sum of squares or vari variation in unit sales growth. So for A, calculate the sample variance of the dependent variable using information in the table. So kind of similar to what we just saw. We're looking for the sample variance of the dependent variable, so that would be the total. Because we're not worried about what our regression is doing, we're just worried about the total dependent, the total move in the dependent variable. So the sum of squares is 95.2. So if we go back to our variance formula, we have yi, so our observed values minus the mean squared over n minus 1. So we have the numerator right here, which is the total sum of squares. So 95.2 over n minus 1, n is 5, so 5 minus 1, and we get a sample variance of 23.8. And here we're not going to square it, uh, or take the square root, sorry, because this is the variance we're not looking for standard deviation. If it asks for standard deviation, we would just take the square root of this. For B, calculate the coefficient of determination for this estimated model once again coefficient of determination is the r squared which tells us how powerful our regression model is or how much of the the variation in the dependent variable is explained by our regression model so to do that we're going to look at the sum of squares for the regression so this is what the variation of the regression is responsible for explaining and then the total variation down here is 95.2 so we're explaining 88 over 95.2 so 88 over 95.2, and we get an R squared of 0 0.93 around that. So this is actually a good model. Um, a lot of the variation in the dependent variable or unit sales growth is explained by the independent variable that we're using. What hypothesis does the FSTAT test? Kind of went over this already, but the FSTAT is going to test whether or not all of the independent variables in your regression model have enough predictive power to be able to explain the dependent variable. So if I came back to my you know, sample ice cream and temperature regression model, you're basically testing the independent variable, which is temperature right here. You're testing the coefficient, so the 6.90. And you're testing whether or not this is st statistically different than zero. So if we just ignore the F test right now, basically what this regression is saying is that for every one unit increase in temperature, I should be able to expect $6.9 more in sales. So basically the F test is testing whether or not this 6.9 is actually you know, a justified number, whether or not it makes sense. And the conclusion of your F test will either be that your regression model with your dependent variables is better, whether or not it's better than a regression model without your independent variables. So it's pretty much, you know, it's like an over, overarching test to see whether or not your, your model is, is actually useful. Because if, you know, your model with your independent variables is not better than your model without the independent variables, then what was the whole point of the model? So that's basically it. For D, is the F test significant at the 5% significance level? So here we could calculate the, the, the F stat based on the information that we have here, but you know, usually in regression outputs, you're gonna get the, the F stat calculated by itself. And with that, we'll also get a P value of the F stat. So we can look at the F stat, which is 36.667. But really, we, we don't even need it to answer this question because we have the p-value, 
of the f-stat, which once again, similar to hypothesis testing, is the lowest level of significance where you can reject the null. So here we have a p-value of 0 0.009, which is less than the significance level of 0 0.00 or 0 0.05. So the f-test is significant. It is significant, which means that our model Very, very simply, our model makes sense. And the independent variables do have predictive power, have power. Coming back to the p-value really quick, you, like even at a 0 0.01 significance level, which is a 99% confidence interval, you would also be able to reject because you can see the p-values is less than the point zero zero one. Last part of this question, calculate the standard error of the estimate. Once again, this is the standard error of the variation of the independent variable that is not explained by our model, which is also known as the residual or like the excess or unexplained. Um, so here, just by looking at the table, we actually have the mean square of the residual. So if you recall the formula of the standard error, the estimate is a square root of the mean square error or residual error and residual, kind of the same thing. Um, so it would actually be really quickly, just take the square root of 2.4 and we get 1.5, around 1.55 is the standard error of the estimate. You could also, we can kind of show you how you can work to calculate the same 1.5 using the, the method that we used in the previous question, um, where we said that the standard error of the estimate was the mean square error or was the unexplained variance divided by n minus k, the number of independent variables, minus 1. So here, unexplained variance is going to be the 95 total variance minus what's explained, which is the 88. Um, we could run the calc, but you can see it's already done here, which is the 7.2. So this is the Unexplained variance, so we could take 7.2 over n is 5, 5 minus 1 minus 1, we have one independent variable, so 7.2 over 3 is 2.4, which is the MSE rate here, the mean square error or mean square residual rate here, and then we could just do the same thing that we just did, so square root of 2.4 is 1.55. This is kind of the, the long way I just showed you, but it's uh, kind of showing the same concept as to how these regression outputs automatically, usually already automatically calculate some of the stuff that we just did in the previous question. Like the whole point of a regression model in practice is to have all these metrics available to you right away. Like if you're you know working in the industry and you're running some sort of regression, like you're not going to have to <laughs> do this manual work to figure out whether or not your model makes sense. It's all going to be given to you in the table. So here we have a pretty long, long worded question. We're going to skim over most of it. The, really the importance that you need to know is that we have a regression output here. And here we actually have, you know, a lot more of the output from regression. We have some more key metrics, whereas we, we only had bits and pieces in the previous questions. Um, but here, just to summarize really quickly, there's some guys running on a regression on a company, and we have the independent variable being net income to sales. And we're using net income to sales to predict the dependent variable, which is cash flow from ops to sales. So net income over sales. You see how well that predicts cash flow from ops to sales. So just kind of logically thinking about it, net income and cash flow from ops are kind of similar. Um, of course, cash flow from ops, you would have stuff like depreciation added back, um, whereas net income, they would be subtracted. But generally, these metrics are somewhat similar. Um, it, you know, would be net income is net income over sales is probably a much better predictor of cash flow from ops to sales than like cost of goods sold or something. 
um, you would expect this model to have some good explanatory power. And if we come back to the regression stats here, you can actually see that the R squared is 0.743, which is pretty high. So that confirms our belief that net income to sales is a good predictor of cash flow from options sales because this model or the net income to sales is explaining roughly 74% of the variance in the cash flow from sales. So this is important. Um, this is pretty much the first thing that any analyst will look at when they run the regression model. This R squared is first thing that pops up, first thing they'll look at. Also down here, we have some sum of squares for like the regression, the residual, the total. We went over this in the last question. Um, key things to point out here is that the sum of squares for the variation in the regression is 0 0.029 versus the total is 0 0.04. So if you were to take the 0 0.029 over the 0 0.04, you would get this R squared here. What's really important is this bottom table here. Um, we haven't seen this yet, and this is really the key key table that we're going to look at for interpreting regressions. And what this is saying, we'll start from the bottom. Um, so we have net income to sales, and we have a coefficient. And what this coefficient is saying is that for every one unit increase in net income to sales, we should expect a 0 0.826 unit increase in cash flow from office to sales. So for every one unit increase in net income to sales, we're going to get 0 0.826 of that is flowing in to cash flow from sales. Um, the intercept here is essentially showing, like if you think of typical algebra, y equals mx plus b, like when you're drawing a straight line on a graph, the intercept is this B here. So it is the value of cash flow from ops to sales when net income to sales is zero. So even if net income is net income to sales is zero, you should still expect 0 0.077 as the ratio of cash flow from ops to sales. We also have some T stats here for both of the intercepts. So this is going to individually test whether both of these rows, so if the intercept and the independent variable are good predictors in the model. So this is the individual test versus the F test that we talked about a little bit earlier, which tests both of these at the same time. So if we're looking at the T stats, we can actually see, you know, instead of having to compare this to a critical T value, we see the P value here is zero in both of them, which means that these are, you know, Definitely, like it's pretty much saying 100%, these are good predictors of cash flow from ops to sales. So that's a quick overview of how to interpret a regression output. Um, hope that makes sense. The, the data that I circled and highlighted here is the key stuff you should expect on the exam. You should know how to interpret it. Um, so with that, let's let, you know, let's actually get to the questions. So for nine, coefficient of determination or R squared is closest to, well, it's already given to us. So that's an easy one, 0.74636. The correlation between X and Y, so between the independent variable and the dependent variable, so the dependent variable is Y, is closest to what? So the correlation is actually the square root of R squared, um, kind of a, you know, the way to interpret it, it, it's a little bit weird. The R squared is used to show the strength of how the regression model, what percentage of the regression model explains the output or the, the difference in the dependent variable, whereas correlation is, is a metric that's used to measure the strength of the relationship. So it's a little bit different. Um, but in either, in either case, if you have to calculate it, all you ought to know it's the square root of R squared, the square root of 0.7436, which is going to be C. And then finally, if the ratio of net income to sales for a restaurant is 5%, the predicted ratio of cash flow from ops to sales is closest to, well, kind of goes back to what I was saying about the whole Y equals MX plus B thing. All, all we're doing in a linear, linear regression is drawing a line 
where we have x is our dependent variable, y is our independent variable, and we're going to have some you know, data points that we use to create the regression like I showed you. It's like you know, somewhere like this, and we create a linear line that is the best fit for the data. So we're, even though like a value, let's say, like x could be 10 and y according to this line that we produce from the model is 12. The actual observed value of y could be like up here at like 14 or something. Um, so there is some some error and, and that's what's reflected in the residuals here, right? Like the sum of squared errors and all that. Um, but this line is essentially used to create the line of best fit such that like all of these data points are close. The average of the difference between these data points is close to the line. So that's how the line is visually created. Um, but anyway, coming back to this output, the actual predicted value of Y or the dependent variable from this from this output would be with this notation with the little hat. So this is what we're predicting. Um, is b zero, which is just the notation for the coefficient, plus v one, which is the the notation for the slope coefficient. So the b zero is the intercept. The b one is the actual variable. So the slope, um, and then times the value of xi. So we can sub all this stuff in given the information from this question. B0 is the slope co or the intercept coefficient, so 0 0.077 plus 0.826, which is the slope coefficient, so 0.826, and then times 5% because we're given the value of xi here. So we are given five, and if we ran all this out, you would get a value of 4.207. So this would be the expected ratio of cash flow from ops to sales if the ratio of net income to sales was five. One more quick question on the same data set. Is the relationship between the ratio of cash flow to ops and the ratio of net income to sales significant at the 5% significance level? A, no, because R squared is greater than 0 0.05. This, this isn't true. R squared is just, to, is just used to say how much the model predicts of the dependent variable. It's not, it, it has no measure of significance. Um, th like this value could be whatever it is. Um, be like 0 0.5, 0 0.2, whatever. Uh, even if the R squared is 0 0.2, it could be st statistically significant. Like the variables down here could be significant and they do explain the variation of the dependent variable. Um, so this actual R squared value doesn't tell, tell you anything about how significant it is. It just tells you the strength of the prediction power in the model, which is a little bit different. Um, so coming down to B, no, because the p-values of the intercept and slope are less than 0.05. So this is actually the the opposite. So we're asking if it's, if to read it again, is the relationship between the ratio of cash flow from ops and the ratio of netting up to sales significant at the 0.5 level? It They are significant, right? So if this said yes, it would be better. Um, but it says no. Like the p-values are less than 0.5, which means they are significant. So this is incorrect. Answer C, but we can talk about it. So they are significant because the p-values for the F and T test, or T stat, or F. So we have the p-value here, p-value here. This is for F, this is for T. Yes, because the p-values for F and T for the slope coefficient are less than 0.05. So this is correct. Um, in, in the case of a simple linear regression, which is what we have, so we have one independent variable, the F test and the T test for the slope coefficient, so this one here, not the intercept one, are pretty much the exact same thing. Because like I said, the F test tests the joint 
joint. So that's keyword. So joint significance of all the independent variables. Independent variables. So if you had like another variable down here, call it like z. You had some other coefficient of like 0 0.9. The f test would test both the strength of both of these at the same time. So there could be a case where the f test like the p-value of the f test indicates that these slope coefficients together are not significant. So this p-value could be like 0 0.1, which means that both of them together are not significant. But from there, we would have to look at the p-values of each of them individually. So it could be the case where there's like the p-value of the z test is like 0.25, which means that the z would not be significant, but the net income to sales is. So kind of a little bit of a tangent there. Just know that the F test and the T test for the slope are different in the case of a simple linear, linear regression with only one variable or a multiple variable, variable regression. But in this case, we could just look at the F or the T. In the case of one variable, the F and the T test will come to the same conclusion. The long question here, so we're going to break it up into, into some different parts. We're going to start with this section first, where we have Elena, who recently joined a company, and, and they're evaluating potential investment opportunities. Um, so they're running the regression analysis to examine the relationship between a company's shares and the returns on crude oil. So share price versus crude crude oil prices. Um, the woman notes the following assumptions of regression analysis. Assumption one, the error term is uncorrelated across observations. Assumption two, the variance of the error term is the same for all observations. Assumption three, the dependent variable is normally distributed. Which, which of her assumptions regarding regression analysis is incorrect? So the incorrect answer is assumption three. So let's see. And in a regression analysis, unlike some of, you know, you might be used to it by now with all of our hypothesis testing, but the dependent variable doesn't need to be normally distributed here. Um, there, there, there's no underlying assumption in the model. You can kind of use the example that I had of, you know, the really quick regression I put together of my ice cream sales company and the temperature. Um, I just put random values in. So like obviously <laughs> the values of sales, which were the dependent variable weren't normally distributed and the regression still ran. So that is not a assumption. Um, the other assumptions here. So the error term is uncorrelated across observations. This is an important one and I can draw something here to illustrate that. So if we have our X and our Y here, so this is our X, our independent variable and Y is our dependent variable. And we drew a simple linear regression or our regression model came up with this line. And the actual values that were used to determine this line were, you know, something like this. It was kind of scattered all over the place. If the error term or what is unexplained by our regression model. So once again, let's say our regression model said if X is 10, Y is 10. So if you drew these lines. This is what our regression model says, but the actual input that we saw was like up here. So Y was really 12. Across all of these differences, so this is using one data point as an example, but you can use like this point here. You can use all of these points, these points, the difference between the actual observed value and the line. If the difference between the regression line and the actual outputs, if the error term was correlated or related, that would mean it would result in something like this. So let's say if the error term was predicting a, a lower value of Y than it really is. So error term would be down here. That means that going forward for all the rest of the observations, if, if, if there was like a negative correlation, all of the error terms would look something like this. There, there would be a higher probability that it's below the regression line, and it would just keep going, keep going, keep going. There would, it, it, it would be less likely that a error term was up here because they're down here and they're correlated, so they're going to move together. 
So a, an important thing with the regression analysis is one, that the error term is uncorrelated and two, that the variance of the error term is the same for all observations. So like the difference or the variance between all of these and the error term are the same. Going to continue along with the question here. So she runs a regression of the share returns, the dependent variable on crude oil returns, which is the independent variable using the monthly data she collected. She's selected data using the regression are presented in exhibit one right here and select the regression outputs are presented in exhibit two. She uses a 1% level of significance in all our tests. So for question 28, based on exhibit one, the standard error of the estimate is closest to which one of these? So we've done this a couple times. We know that the standard error of the estimate is equal to the square root of the mean square error, um, which is basically the unexplained variance or the residual from the independent variable value that the regression model predicts versus the actual the actual value of the independent variable for a certain level of the independent or for a certain level of the dependent variable. So we kind of touched on it briefly, but one quick thing to note again, and this is really important, is that the predicted value of y or the dependent variable is it has a notation of this little hat. So yi with the hat versus the actual value is just yi, so no hat. So if we're looking at the difference or the residual between the two, we have, we're going to be, need to look at yi minus y hat i. And if we recall, the equation for the standard error is going to be the square of the unexplained variance, which is right up here. So y i minus y hat i squared, which we're already given. And we're going to divide this by n minus k minus 1 and take the square root of all of that because everything underneath this is the mean square error whereas we want the standard error of the estimate um, so kind of looking at this chart at this output it's uh, kind of hard to read they're giving you all of these columns um, i guess to show you the step-by-step -step process to get to this uh like you can even see in the sample regression model that i did in excel that the like regression outputs usually don't have this um you're just going to have the the end metrics that you need like you wouldn't need to back calculate any of it especially in practice but i guess they're just trying to one make things a bit more difficult and to show you how everything's derived but anyway along the rows we have month one month 36 and she ran the regression based on monthly data. So it looks like just looking at this, there's a bunch of months in here that they didn't include just because, you know, it would make the question so long and probably couldn't fit in the book. Um, and the reason I know that as well is because if I come to the sum total and I'm looking at the squared residual, which is what I need for this equation, the sum of this, the 0.07 is not the sum of the square re residual for the individual months, right? So if we're worried about the standard error of the estimate, it's going to be for the total regression. It's not asking for a specific month here. So we're going to take this value here, which if we sub into our, qu our equation is this yi minus y hat i squared. So I'll run out of space, but I'll bring it up here. So we're going to get the standard error is equal to this point 0.071475 over n minus k minus 1. So the sample size is 36, right? It's 36 and minus k, we have one independent variable. So minus 1 minus 1 is 34. And we take the square root of all of that. I know it's a bit messy, but if you were to do that in the calculator, we're going to get a value of 0.04585. So our answer is B.
one one other small thing to note um the regression output that you saw in the last question is much more indicative of what you should see on exam day like there's there's too much going on here i i, I think it's very unlikely you get a regression output like this on the exam um, but nonetheless it's a it's a good learning opportunity to do something a little bit more complex continuing along we have the bottom part of the question down here so we have some critical t values at a one percent level of significance so we have these three values here and this last paragraph isn't relevant for this question but we'll get to this paragraph in a second anyway for 29 based on exhibit 2 so down here she should reject the null that the slope is less than or equal to 0 0.15 reject the null that the intercept is less than or equal to 0 or reject the null that crude oil returns do not explain the share returns so we have to do three separate hypothesis tests here for the coefficient, so the intercept coefficient and the oil return coefficient. The formula for to calculate the T stat, because remember we need the T stat to compare to the critical T values to either reject or not reject the null. The formula for the T stat when you're, when you're in regressions is somewhat similar to the calculation of the T stat for hypothesis testing, just a little bit different, but pretty much the same. So if we're doing it for the slope coefficient, which is B1, it's B1 minus B, capital B0, which is the hypothesized value over the standard error. So it's a little bit different. Um, the top, the numerator is the exact same. Only difference is on the bottom here where we're doing the standard error versus the in hypothesis testing was a standard deviation divided by the root of n. But regardless, we can go ahead and basically make three different hypothesis tests. So for A, what are we testing? The slope is less than or equal to 0 0.15. So it's a one-sided test. And the calculation for the test that is going to be B1, which is this 0 0.2354, 0 0.2354 is less than or equal to 0 0.15 so 0 0.15 is a hypothesized value divided by the standard error which is 0 0.076 and if we calculate this we get a value a t stat of 1.1237 which now we're gonna have to compare to one of the critical values so we're worried about a um one-sided test so the slope is less than or equal to 1 0 0.15 is the null so the alternative is that it's greater than, remember, for a one-sided test, you're comparing the T stat to the critical value on the same side as the alternative hypothesis. So this is actually a right-sided test. So coming down here, a one-sided right side test, the critical value is 2.441. This is less than 2.441. So we do not reject the null. So this is incorrect. Going down, we have B. The intercept is less than or equal to zero. So the the formula for the stat is the exact same. It's just here we're doing the intercept, so it's going to be B0. Oh, sorry, this should have been B1. Hypothesis value B1, but now we're doing B0 minus capital B0. And if we sub all that in, what do we have? We have B0 is 0 0.0000. 0 0.0095 less than or equal to zero so minus zero over the standard error which is 0 0.0078 and we get a value of 1.2179 and it, what are we doing we're doing a two-sided oh nope sorry we're doing a one-sided test so the intercept is less than or equal to zero which is a null so the alternative is is that it's greater than or equal to zero, so we're on the right side again. We're using the same critical value that we used up here, one, one side or right side critical value. And this is less than, once again, the 2.441, so we do not reject this. Answer is going to be C, but we can go ahead and explain it. So the null, she should reject the null that crude oil returns do not explain share returns so basically what this is saying is that it's testing if 
B1, the null is at B1 is equal to zero, which is the slope, because the crude oil returns are being used to predict the share returns. So last one, you can do it for C. Um, and what we're saying, basically, like I said, we're testing whether it's equal to zero. So this is a two-sided test. So all we need is whether or not the crude oil returns have some explanatory power. Um, so we're going to have a T stat of same thing, B1. So 0 0.2354, subtract zero over the standard error of 0 0.0760. And we get a value of 3.0. 0974. This is our T stat, which is on the outside of the two sided test. So we reject the null that crude oil returns do not explain share returns. In other words, we reject the null that this B1 is equal to zero. So this B1 actually does have explanatory power at some significance level to predict the share returns. Last couple of questions here. So based on exhibit two and her prediction of the crude oil return for month 37, which was down here. So she expects the crude oil return next month to be negative 0.01. The estimate of the share return for month 37 is closest to what? So this is a simple plug and play where we're gonna have Y hat I. So what we're predicting is equal to B, B naught, which is this, the intercept coefficient plus B1, which is the slope coefficient, times our value of X, which is what was just given. So really simple, take our intercept of 0 0.0095 plus 0 0.2354, which is the slope, times negative 0 0.01. And simple math here, we get a value of 0 0.0071. And that's our answer, B.